Right now on Law and Crime Special Report, Justice and Peace. The latest in the tragic Elijah McClain case. Interim Police Chief Vanessa Wilson announced an internal affairs investigation into claims that multiple Aurora police officers were depicted in photographs mocking Elijah McClain's death near the site that he died. Plus, the officer who fired two bullets into the back of Rayshard Brooks, former officer Garrett Rolfe, has been released from jail after posting $50,000 bond with the help of police organizations. Later, viral video shows a Missouri couple pulling out firearms on protesters as they led a march to the St. Louis mayor's residence. Justice and Peace bringing you inside the movement for police reform. It's Wednesday, July 1st, 2020. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer, here at Justice and Peace. Let's start off with the Elijah McClain case. Now, if you recall, that is the case out of Aurora, Colorado, where a young man that we suspect may have been somewhere on the spectrum was stopped, detained, and accosted by officers. He was later given ketamine by EMT officers and died of brain damage days later in the, in the hospital. Now, we're hearing some reports about what happened tangentially or outside of the death of Elijah McClain that's starting to bring up a lot of question marks as to how the Aurora police handle themselves. First, we're hearing that, the inter that there's an internal affairs investigation that was brought up by the chief because there were reports of officers uh, and it's kind of mixed, around the area, mocking maybe um, the manner in which Elijah McClain died. And it's bringing up a lot of questions as to how these officers conduct themselves. Now, I'm joined with a good friend of mine, Eugene Tosant. He's both a criminal defense attorney here in New York, a resident of, uh, born and raised in the Bronx, as well as a host uh, for Attorneys with Swag, a podcast. Eugene, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I, I want to have you here because because you could talk about the relationship between police officers and the community, not just in terms of of violence, but their kind of culture towards civilians. What did you make when you first heard of this story of Elijah McClain, and then also how the officers are kind of portraying his death afterwards? I mean, when it comes to Elijah McClain, I think what you have to realize is that. They still haven't explained exactly why they were stopping him. And, if, and when it comes to, um, once they actually did stop him, they, have, they look at the reason why they're talking about, oh, he's grabbing for guns, because they realized that they put, placed themselves in a situation where they had no reason to stop him, right? Um, Colorado it operates just like New York, in which you actually need reasonable suspicion to detain uh, um, a suspect. And they, they didn't have reasonable suspicion to um, stop him. At most, they, had, they could have approached him and asked him what he was doing, and when he didn't want to talk to them, that should have been it. But police don't operate like the way they should. They operate basically like a gang, and when they, when they want to stop you, even if they don't have the correct level of suspicion, and you don't um, respond to them the way they, 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 way they want you to, they start to act aggressive because that's how gangs operate, right? And when it comes to them disrespecting the site of his death, that's, that's, that's just showing that they have no remorse they have um, no self-reflection. They can't realize when they made a mistake and they can't own up to it. What they rather do is kind of gather together and support each other regardless of the circumstances. Yeah. Now, two days ago, Chief of Police Vanessa Wilson gave a response uh, based on some of the photos that they, that, they, that they had seen. And she said, Thursday afternoon, I was apprised of allegations reported to Eternal Affairs by Aurora police officer, alleging multiple Aurora police officers were depicted in photographs near the site where Elijah McClain died. All involved officers were immediately placed on administrative leave with pay in non-enforcement capacities, immediately ordered uh, the internal affairs to make the investigation their top priority. This accelerated investigation was completed this evening. The investigation will be publicly released in its entirety promptly upon its conclusion. This will include reports, photographic evidence obtained, officer's name, and a final determination which can rise to the level of termination. Now, of course, there's a due process right that they have that is their job, so you've got to go through the steps. But Eugene, this release is telling me a lot, but also not telling me anything at all. Because no officer is going to be reprimanded for simply just being in the area. We're not saying officers cannot be around where they are sus suspects of killing individuals or, or murdering them if it gets to legal issues. So it's very obvious that they're not just in the area. They're doing something that would have led them to be reprimanded. Why are we getting more? Why is this, this culture of, well, we're going to keep it insulated before uh, we actually tell the public? 
because they haven't figured out what exactly they want to say yet, right? Because f from the beginning, they're not, they're going to try their best to protect these officers. Then they're going to try their best to frame it in a way in which they don't have to fire them, right? Whereas like if they let this information out as it comes along, they're not going to have time to sugarcoat it and make it to less, to less than the degree of whatever they did. But it's clear that they were doing something that is not appropriate for police officers to do. And if I lived, if I lived in Aurora, I wouldn't have want police officers like this to, even if they weren't exactly involved in the arrest, for them to see it as a situation where the, they, those, those police officers did nothing wrong, even though someone uh, turned out uh, was killed, uh, having done nothing in this situation. Yeah, we're definitely waiting to see when those photos get released. My bottom dollar would bet that it's going to get released sometime late in Friday, just before the long weekend. Hopefully they can slide it in when everyone's trying to celebrate. But that's just my opinion. We'll see how that plays out. Let's switch gears just a little to talk about when the officers are seen on camera conducting actions that I think would be less than respectable for the men and women that we want to be in blue uh, protecting and serving us. There was actually a peaceful vigil, not a protest, not looting, not rioting, but the most peaceful of all vigils you can probably imagine of individuals being told to come out with their string instruments, because if you recall, Elijah McClain was known for playing the violin to young animals, especially cats, uh, and they wanted to honor him in that way and the way the Aurora Police Department decided they would handle this was to kick them out of that area with, in full riot gear as if they were there uh, for some sort of military exercise. Let's take a quick look of how that looked because it was caught on camera. that I, I really want to show you there is that the use of tear gas. You can see that a canister was thrown out. Can't see which officer or direction it came from, but a canister was thrown out, and you can see the smoke dispersing. That's tear gas, okay? But the Aurora Police Department said in their report that no tear gas was used. And so again, Eugene, coming back to this, we're, we're seeing an overall culture of do what I say or else and don't believe what you see I'll tell you what you saw. I don't see this as being a community where the citizens can trust the police. What do you see in this? I mean, I see police officers acting like they're gang members. I see them, I see them not liking that their authority is being questioned and, if, and, and interacting with citizens in a way that you would never expect a public servant to interact with them. Like, at the end of the day, even if they had justifiable reasons for being there, they were concerned that somehow this, this vigil was gonna get out of control, they should not be the first ones um, engaging interactions with the protesters, right? If they are, if if you give them all the benefit of the doubt in the world, in which they are there just in case something happens, that something happening should not be started by them. They shouldn't be start, starting their encounters with the protesters. They shouldn't be the ones uh, making the first move. And but that's not, but in fact, that's not what they're there for. They're there to um, threaten and intimidate people because they just don't like their authority being questioned. And they're doing this for a person who's in the wrong in the first place. But that just kind of goes that they don't operate like how, it police, how you expect the police department to operate. They operate like they're a gang. And they, in, in a gang, if one person is being threatened, you're all being threatened. 
and regardless of whether that person is wrong or right. Yeah, and I think this and Eugene, we've, we've uh, I'll let the cat out of the bag. We've worked together in capacity. We started as defense attorneys from the beginning, and we've seen this in our training, in our practice, where it goes beyond just saying, well, we only want to criticize the one or two or three or four officers who actually um, harmed Elijah McClain. This is a culture where other officers will double down, like you're saying, Eugene. Well, they might have done something quasi bad, but we're going to double down and do this against a community of people just to, what, impose our will? That's an issue that we at Justice Peace are trying to highlight and show. We're going to continue with more after this break. All right, so a video has gone viral. You've probably seen it of a Missouri couple from St. Louis outside in their gated community, just on, kind of like on the porch of where their home is, holding the woman a handgun and the man, and the man holding what seems to be like an AK-47 with an extended magazine. Now, they're simply brandishing the gun. The arguments their lawyer is making, castle doctrine, protecting their home. The, the people who are protesting, they were there because there were calls for the mayor, Krusen, to be resign or to leave for doxing people who are in support of uh, police reform. Doxing being given those people's personal information, their name and their address on the air. Let's start by looking at that reaction that that couple had when they saw protesters walking into their community. All right, y'all see he got a gun and shit. And y'all can see. Y'all see on my live feed, live. He got his rifle. Uh, if y'all can see. He does have a weapon. And y'all can see. This individual does have the rifle. Y'all screenshot this. Get out. Get out. Get out. Now, giving full context, later on it appears based on photographs that gate you saw in the second clip, that gate to the right was broken. That's important because what these individuals told police is that they were victims of trespassing or fourth degree assault. That what occurred is that when they heard a loud commotion outside on the street, they went to investigate and they saw a large group of suspects forcibly breaking the iron gate, an iron gate that says no trespassing and private street signs. However, based on the video you just saw of an individual holding a gate and people walking through peacefully in the sense that they are not doing any damage to any people or harming or, or damage to any property, sorry, or harming any people and no damage to property was done at that point. They're already there with a gun. That story does not fly. That appears to be an absolute lie. So their response to guns leads to questions of who is really the victim here. I'm again joined with Eugene Toussaint, a uh, criminal defense attorney and host of Attorneys with Swag podcast. Eugene, break this down for me. I know that a lot of our clients don't have private property, so even for me, this was like, I don't know how you evaluate this, but how, how would you break this down factually and legally? I mean, the argument that they're trying to make in which they're just protecting their property, it, you, can, you can, one, just a pure distance, right? These people are in no way trying to get into their home which is what the castle doctrine is, is meant for, for actual people trying to invade 
your, more than just your property with your lawn, but you're trying to protect your home. The idea that you needed a gun, these people were trying to walk through their property for the purposes of, of reaching the mayor's home for a purpose of a protest, and they had no other access but to go through this, this entrance, at least that's my understanding. The idea that they were any way in danger to the point that they had to escalate the situations, use guns to protect themselves, it's just it's not supported by the video. I mean, not only is there a barrier between where these protesters are walking and where their home begins, which you can see in the video, the, the, the pure distance, right? They're, they're not anywhere close to that, that, that couple's home. Yeah, they might be um, on what a, it's a community, a neighborhood's private walkway, but that does not rise to the level that you have to feel that you have to pull out guns. If anything, you're escalating the situations and you're making it more likely that something that is not intended to happen to, to happen. I mean, they're trying to intimidate these people in, in a situation that where it just purely wasn't necessary. I think the argument they're trying to make in which they felt fearful, I mean, how can you feel fearful of people who clearly are making their attentions known and they're speaking back and forth, whether they're doing it in a disrespectful manner or not, they're making it clear that they weren't there to harass or engage with the couple at all. They were basically just walking by. What they should have did is just let them walk by. Yeah, and, and I don't think factually they're supported here in their claim of defense, and I don't want our viewers to think you cannot defend your home, that mass mobs can walk onto your property and you have to do nothing. No, you can, but you've got to look at it from a factual standpoint, especially when it comes to proportionality of force. Now, in a lot of those photos, you're seeing the young woman with her finger on the actual trigger. And that, if you ask any law enforcement agent, if you ask any person in the military, uh, as I've had people reach out to me and said, Brian, we are trained that when you put your finger on that trigger, whatever is facing you is done, is going down, is dying. And so I think that's where the, a really big issue becomes, because anyone who does have a gun, who owns a gun, who should know proper gun safety, that rises to a level that gets really dangerously close to deadly force. And I know in Missouri and New York and probably most states in the United States of America, you cannot use deadly force for simple trespass upon your property. And so from a factual and legal standpoint, this family could have a lot of negative implications for how they address this, this, uh, this, uh, this protest. Let's switch gears just one more time as we're coming to the end of the show. Yesterday, we had a bond hearing to decide whether or not Officer uh, Garrett Rolf would get bond or be remanded without a possibility of getting out of jail. Uh, and the judge decided that $500,000, half a million dollars, would be the appropriate amount to ensure that this officer comes back to court, along with certain conditions of surrendering a passport, having an ankle monitor um, for the charges of murdering Rayshard Brooks, putting two bullets in his back after he was running away, he being Rayshard, Rayshard Brooks, uh, with a taser in his hand. Now, we were able to watch that bond hearing yesterday live at Law and Crime. Let's look at the video again. Uh, of Rayshard Brooks, or sorry, let's, let's listen to Rayshard Brooks' widow, uh, Tamika Miller, talk about how this incident has affected her and her family. So, Your Honor, I'm asking that the bond does not be granted due to my health, my mental state. I have to still raise my children. I don't have a big support group. It's just me and my children that's all i have my best friend has been taken my helpmate has been taken and never in a million years i would imagine myself being called a widow miss miller i want to thank you I, I, I don't know if you can hear me but i want to thank you um for speaking to us today and i heard you all right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, Eugene, this is my two cents about this. This officer was able to be released based on the support of a police organization raising money. Our clients as defense attorneys also have similar funds to that because there are bail funds, especially in New York, but not around the country. My issue when it comes to how much uh, bond was given for someone who's accused of murder, police officers get a different level of bond than 
plumbers, electricians, uh, UPS uh, drivers, uh, name a profession that our clients work. And it clearly becomes a two-tiered system that if you murder someone or are accused of doing so, if you have a badge, you get one amount of bond. If you don't, you get another, or maybe you just don't get bond at all. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, this office, I mean, they, in fact, the judge only set $250,000 bond for the murder. And actually, the, the rest of the bond was just for the rest of the charges that he, he's being charged with. So, so what we're actually talking about is $250,000. It's clear that, you know, either when you talk about bond funds that our clients have access to, there's not a bond fund in the world that's going to pay that much for a bond in a case in which one of our clients gets accused of shooting someone in the back and then kicking him while he's down. Like, and, and, and not, not only is he not going to have access to that bond fund, but in, more likely than not, he will be remanded in that case. Just given the fact that you have, you don't just have a situation where um, it's clear that like an argument of self-defense makes sense because he's, he, he hit him after he's down, or at least that's what's being alleged, that they have proof that he kicked him while he was down. Um, I think if you're going to set bail in this case, $500,000, knowing that he's going to have police officers, he's going to have um, GoFundMe's and stuff like that access to in this situation is, is far too little and far too low of an amount. And it, does, and, and it would not be afforded to any, uh, cli any client of a public defender in a million years, not in a million years. Yeah, okay, definitely. Um, and, and again, this is a situation where I think we are asking I don't, I don't want officers to be treated like my clients. I don't want anyone in the world to be treated like my clients. What I want is a level of humanity that one group of people are getting that appears is not reserved for another group. That, that is, and I wanna make sure my point is clear on that one. I, I now wanna bring in Bob Bianchi. Bob, I know you've got uh, Keeping the Peace coming up next. Tell us what, tell us what we got uh, to look forward to. Brian, great. We got Rashard Brooks. We're gonna be talking about that in a little more detail. Uh, some developments with George Floyd and, and a window into what some of the police officers' defenses may be in this case, including uh, a case where a Tulsa, Oklahoma police officer was shot and killed. We're going to get into a little bit of that. And Robert Fuller, uh, the individual who was found hanged, it was called an accident. Um, we got a lot to talk about in that case as well, Brian. I'm looking forward to it. Got it. Be there. And to everyone, happy uh, Canada Day who's celebrating on July 1st. I'll see you tomorrow.